time off, so he asked me to teach tonight. So if you guys came tonight, you're expecting Brian, sorry for the disappointment. But I do know this, that the Lord will speak to us through his word. So uh, let's ask him to bless this study and let's get started because Nick is keeping me on a strict schedule tonight. He said that I am the king of going over. Ah, oh, Nick. Okay. Sam's way worse. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to come to another church service or to study your word. I know that this is something that we can easily take for granted, Lord. Just the freedom that you've given us to be able to have a building, Lord, for us to even just have a copy of your word, Lord, is something that's so desired in other countries. And Lord, I pray that we would be wise with this freedom that you've given us, that we would make sure and take time. Lord, I'm so thankful that these guys would come out on a Wednesday, Lord, to just get this extra time in your word. Lord, we pray that we would leave here with something to meditate on. Father, we know that you have things you want to say to us, Lord. And as we're going to read tonight, Lord, that you speak and help us to be aware of your presence, Lord. Help us to be listening to your voice. And I pray that you would use this study in our lives. In your holy name we pray, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Yeah, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Um, today, I had a really cool opportunity um, Rodney, student at Old Town High School, um, he takes a class at Old Town called JMG, Jobs for Maine Graduates. And he had talked to his teacher um, about giving me an opportunity to come in and just share a little bit about masonry work. And so I, was, I got to hang out at Old Town all day today, which was really cool because obviously at youth group, we get a lot of teens here. And um, I, got to see, I got to see all the teens in their school element, which was really eye-opening. Uh, I wasn't surprised, I don't think, at what I saw. You know, I think I could tell what I would see just based on knowing them. Um, but what was really cool was my day started there at 7.30, because on Wednesdays at 7.30, Caleb and Rodney do FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And that's new to th that's this year that they just started that at Old Town High School. And so I was able to sit in and hear that study. So that was really cool. So the day started, 7.30 at FCA. At 8 o'clock, I had the first class, which was obviously in, in a classroom setting. And just the opportunity to meet new teens and to kind of get somewhat of a foot in the door, maybe over there. You know, I met a lot of the teachers, um, thanks to Rodney. He gave me a tour of the school, you know. I'm amazed at how much freedom this kid has. I don't even, do you, did you go to school? Did you do classes today? <laughs> it was an awesome opportunity. I got to eat lunch in the cafeteria, and then I went to another room and ate lunch, and went to another room and ate lunch. There was just a bunch of teens that were, I, I told them, I threatened them on Tuesday night. I was like, if you guys see me tomorrow and you ignore me, I'm going to embarrass you. And so they didn't ignore me. They were gracious. First uh, Samuel chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim, or grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, while Samuel was lying down. So some background. We're jumping in right in chapter 3. Uh, in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, we're introduced to this man, Elkanah. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right or not, but Elkanah, let's just call him that. And um, his wife, Hannah, he had two wives. Um, we'll just call her Panini, because I can't think of her name. It rhymes with the sandwich. Um, and obviously, God had it set up, you know, that we would obviously have one wife. And in no way does God's word endorse, you know, more than one wife. But in this sense, um, and in 
all kinds of different occasions. We see King David taking multiple wives unto himself. We see this pattern. It does not mean it's biblical at all. Um, but nonetheless, Elkanah, he had more than one wife, and the wife that he really loved was Hannah, but she was barren. She couldn't have kids. And in that culture, in that day, when you couldn't have kids, it was really a sign that the Lord wasn't blessing you, that there was, for some reason or another, the Lord was actually mad at you. And see, they obviously looked forward to having kids because of Genesis 3.15. They knew the promise of a Messiah, a Savior, was going to be born through the, the seed of a woman, which that statement right there, we've talked about that, the seed of the woman. You know, the woman doesn't have the seed, so that speaks of a supernatural conception. And that was every lady's dream, to, to be a Jewish mom and to, to give birth to the Messiah. And so for them to be barren was really a sign. It was a shameful thing. And so... Um, in chapters 1 and 2, we're told about Hannah and how she was depressed, that she couldn't have kids, and, and, and Elkanah's other wife was blessed with kids. And, and Hannah comes to a place where she's at the, the tabernacle, and this priest, Eli, sees her praying. And, and she's praying so passionately that, that Eli comes up to her, and basically he accuses her of being drunk. Because she's, she's not speaking her prayer, she's moving her lips, but she's praying in her heart. And obviously, when we go to the Lord in prayer, we don't have to say it out loud. We can pray to the Lord in our hearts. You guys can hopefully be praying for me right now in your hearts that I get through this. Um, but the, the high priest, Eli, he came to her and he basically said, hey, you need to take a hike, you need to get out of here. You know, what are you doing drinking? And she... she confronted him and said, I'm, what are you talking about? I'm pouring out my heart to the Lord, you know, leave me alone. And, and Eli, he basically says, oh man, are you serious? I'm so sorry. He said, you know what, you leave here and the Lord's going to give you a son. And sure enough, the Lord blessed her with Samuel and she made a promise to the Lord. She said, Lord, if you give me a son, I'm going to dedicate him back to you. Um, unlike all the vows and promises we make to the Lord, she followed through. You know, she was faithful to do that. When Samuel was about three or four years old, she went back to the tabernacle and she, she presented her son Eli, she presented her, presented her son Samuel to Eli to, to serve the Lord in the tabernacle. And Samuel was faithful to do that, even as a young boy, as we read in chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And what's interesting is in chapter 3, verse 1, it says he ministered to the Lord before Eli. In the previous chapter, it says that, that Samuel ministered to Eli before the Lord. But now all of a sudden this transition has happened. He's no longer serving Eli, so to speak, but it says here that he served the Lord before Eli. And obviously the truth of that statement that as, as we seek to serve the Lord, may we truly be serving the Lord and not, and not seeking to please men. And, and I think that can, can be a struggle, you know, and we need to make sure we find that balance. And another thing I want to point out is it says, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord. He was just a boy. You know, uh, Josephus says that he was probably around 12 years old. He wasn't any older because he would have been considered a man. He didn't have his bar mitzvah yet. And so as a boy... He was ministering to the Lord. And that challenges me. You know, certainly I have a heart for the youth, being the youth pastor. And myself, growing up, you know, I, I, I gave my life to the Lord when I was eight years old. Um, I certainly didn't grow up in the tabernacle as Samuel did, but kind of think of the place um, where Samuel grew up. You know, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was there. The, the very presence of God was there. Eli, sorry, Samuel as a, as a boy doing the, the errands of the, of the tabernacle, you know, um, taking out the trash, making sure the floors were swept, and, and really serving the Lord by doing those things. And we're, we're going to find out, uh, verse 7 says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Samuel is the perfect picture of a church kid, you know, He's, he's growing up in the tabernacle. He's doing all of these um, duties, so to speak. But yet, he doesn't yet know the Lord. Now, this is, he's, right on, he's right on the edge, because as we're going to read, the Lord speaks to him. And, um, and it's incredible that the Lord would speak to a boy. And I guess I just want to point out that age, you know, really has nothing to do with the Lord using you. 
you know, you don't need to wait until you're older for the Lord to, to use you. And, and that, that's relative. You know, I'm, I'm young, I think, you know, as the years go by, I'm starting to realize I'm not so young anymore. I'm 31. Um, but even with me, sometimes there's a temptation to, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve the Lord in that capacity, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm 40 or when I'm, when I'm older, you know, maybe even 60, Nick's age. You know, you're just going to wait <laughs> until you're, you're older. Uh, but the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord. It's possible, guys, to minister to the Lord when you're young. And I'm so blessed to see Caleb and Rodney and these guys step up and do these things at Old Town. It's just such an encouragement. Um, continuing on in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And so when we look at what those days were like, clearly the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And what, what, what that statement means is that the Lord wasn't actively speaking to them anything new. They, had, they, they knew what the Lord expected of them, but they weren't doing it. And oftentimes, when we're not faithful to do what God has already called us to do, he's not going to speak to us until we do the things that he already expects us to do. Make sense? You know, and so if, if you're in a point in your life and you're thinking, man, the Lord's just not really speaking to me, or, you know, I just, I don't feel close to the Lord. Well, is there something the Lord has asked you to do that you haven't done yet? Um, and certainly in Hebrews chapter 1, um, it talks about, you know, the Lord speaking to us through prophets and in various ways, but in these last days, how has the Lord chosen to speak to us? Through his Son. Th- through his Son, and ultimately through his Word. And so there, there was no widespread revelation. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Um, we certainly can't say that about the day and age we live in. Uh, the word of the Lord is not rare. In fact, we have it complete before us right here to read it. And uh, 49, I think, different languages. Uh, there, are, there have been times in history where the word of the Lord was rare, but that was due to illiteracy, people being unable to read. Uh, and what happened as a result of people not knowing or being able to read the scripture that ushered in the Dark Ages, you know, a thousand years of the Dark Ages, which horrible things took place during that time period, and, and people were in bondage. But it, it was a result of people not being able to read God's word. And so when it says the word of the Lord was rare in those days, there was no widespread revelation, that kind of gives us some insight on how dark it was during this time period for the nation of Israel. In chapters 1 and 2, we're told about Hophni and Phinehas, the, the priests, Eli's sons. Were they honorable? No, they were extremely dishonorable. Um, they lived immorally. They, they slept around with women there coming in. They took advantage of people's sacrifice. It got so bad uh, that it says in verse 17 of chapter 2, Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. That's scary. They were disrespecting God so blatantly that people didn't even want to go sacrifice to the Lord anymore because they knew they would have to deal with Hophni and Phinehas. And so the word of the Lord was rare in those days. People were living immorally. And it's really telling when the spiritual leaders are living in such a way. It really tells us the state of the nation of Israel. Kind of reminds me of when Jesus came on the scene and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they they were hypocrites. And and you can always gauge the temperature of a church by looking at the leaders that are in the church. And, And you can always tell what direction they're going in by looking at what direction the leaders of the church are going in. Uh, Verse 2, it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place. And when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. Certainly that is a picture of the nation of Israel spiritually. Their spiritual eyes had grown dim uh, so they could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. Isn't that incredible? That this boy Samuel grew up so close to the very presence of God. You know, the Ark of the Covenant being right there, and, and, and certainly his duties taking care of the tabernacle. Um, so it's bedtime. Eli goes to lie down. Samuel goes to lie down. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. 
lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose, he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So this kind of paints, paints a picture for us. I, pers- I, I personally think that Samuel was used to lying down at night and was used to hearing Eli call to him. Hey, Samuel. He runs in. Yeah. Can you give me a, can you give me a drink of water? Yeah, I got it. You know, and he runs and gets him a drink of water. And, 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 and he was just familiar with getting up and doing that. And so this night, no different than all the rest, he hears someone call him. He jumps up, runs in. Hey, what do you want, Eli? What are you talking about, Samuel? Go back to bed. Eli's around 90 years old at this point. He's an old man. You know, he's got this young whippersnapper running in his room. Man, get out of here. I'm trying to sleep. And then again, he jumps up, runs in again. And, and this high priest, Eli, very perceptive, um, understanding, hey, you know what? I think it's the Lord. I think the Lord's calling you. And then he, he gives Samuel some instructions, which, which we'll look at, which, are, which, which these instructions offer us insight when the Lord's speaking to us, how we should respond. But before that, guys, let's talk about voices. Am I the only one who has lots of voices speaking to him throughout the day? <laughs> I'm kind of crazy. Um, we, we all deal with three different voices on a day-to-day basis. And that's perfectly normal. You're not crazy. Or at least I say that to make myself feel more comfortable. Perhaps we are. Um, the, the first voice that constantly speaks to us is our own. Our own voice. We're very familiar with that voice, aren't we? We're very familiar with the voice of our flesh. We're familiar with the voice of, I'm familiar with the voice of Rosaire. I know what Rosaire wants me to do, you know. And, and, I'm, and I'm quick to listen to Rosaire's voice often. Should I trust my flesh? Should I trust my voice? The Bible says that my heart is desperately wicked. I shouldn't be trusting that. No way. Do you know no one lies to us more than ourselves? I, we constantly lie to ourselves. Oh, you know, it's just a little thing. It's just one glance. Not a big deal. You know, it's not a sin. It's, not, it's only wrong if you actually commit it, you know. Or fill in the blank. We're constantly lying to ourselves. And and, and, and I don't think I've ever listened to my flesh and it's, it's turned out all right. You know, it never leads us in a, in a good direction. So that's a voice that we constantly hear. And you can look, uh, for example, in Genesis, um, Eve, when she's in a dialogue with the second voice we're going to talk about, which is the voice of our enemy, uh, deception. And certainly we do have an enemy who wants us to fail Uh, But when you look at that dialogue in Genesis chapter 3, Eve is talking to the serpent, and she says, you know, yeah, we can't eat of this tree, and we can't touch, she says. She just lied to herself. That is not what the Lord said. The Lord said, don't eat of it. He didn't say you can't touch it. He said, just don't eat it. And so right there is a perfect example of, you know, we lie to ourselves. And, And so we need to be careful about listening to um, the voice of our flesh. The second voice, the enemy. And he does have a voice. And, and he does try to get us to fail. Sometimes he's successful. Uh, 1 Peter 5.8 Our enemy walks around like a roaring lion. Have you ever seen on the Discovery Channel a lion hunt? Does a lion go after the biggest, baddest looking ox out there? You know, or ox? Um, what it will the beast? Do they go after the strongest looking animal? No, they're a predator. You know, they, they seek out the weak. They look for an opportunity when someone is at their weakest point. You know, when uh, you know a, a little animal gets away from the pack, and then they they take advantage of that. 
Guys, our enemy has been around a lot longer than we've, we've been here. And he knows how to get us to fail. He's had a lot of practice on a lot of people before us. And he knows weakness. He knows how to pinpoint it. And he knows how to speak in and, and, and deceive. Um, there's three times we hear the voice. In, in Biblically, we see Satan speak. Anyone know the first time? The garden. He speaks to Eve. And in that scenario, he is accusing God to Eve. It says in Revelation that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, that he constantly accuses us. Quite opposite from what the Lord does. What is Jesus doing for us right now in heaven, according to Hebrews chapter 11? He, he's constantly interceding for us. So we have, we have our enemy who's accusing us, and then we have Jesus who's, who's, who's died on the cross and paid for our sins. What's he doing with his voice? He's interceding for us. And so the first time we see the, or hear the voice of Satan, it's in the garden, and he's accusing God to Eve. He just doesn't want you to do it because he knows if you do, you'll become like him, accusing God, telling, telling her that God's a liar. The second time, second time we hear the enemy speak verbally, Job. Job. And in Job, we see Satan standing before God, and who is he accusing? Job. He's accusing Job to God. He's only living this way because you've blessed him. You take away everything he has. And again, he, it's proof that he is the accuser, that that's his voice to accuse. And maybe there's things you've done that you're not too proud of. And, and honestly, we, we, there's probably things we've done that we should be shameful of. But the thing is, is the enemy will accuse us. And, and, and God's word says, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. That's why the kingdom of the enemy will not stand, because not only does he tempt us, but he then, in turn, accuses us, and he's divided against himself. And so his kingdom's not going to last, but we see, we see his voice then. He's accusing man to God. And then the third time, in the wilderness, the temptation, which is very interesting because in the garden, he's accusing God to man. In heaven, he's accusing man to God. And then all of a sudden, in the wilderness, he's facing the God-man, and he doesn't know what to do. And he tries to do a combination of the two, and he looks at Jesus, the Son of God, and he says, if you're the Son of God. He's causing, trying to get Jesus to doubt who he is. And that's a tactic that, Jesus, that Satan will do in our own lives. He'll accuse us, and he'll try to beat us down. And so that's a, that's a voice that we hear. Uh, and then the third voice. The voice of the Lord. The Holy Spirit speaking to us. And what a contrast between the two. And here, it's, it's, it's impressive that the Almighty God, the Creator of the universe, who, according to Hebrews 11, spoke the world into existence, that same voice can be dialed down so as to speak to a boy or speak to us as humans and not completely disintegrate us. <laughs> you know, isn't that incredible? that the very same voice that spoke the world into existence can speak to my heart in a gentle voice. It can speak to a, a boy's heart. The very same voice who, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the garden, they said, Where, where's Jesus? Who's Jesus of Nazareth? And what did Jesus say? He said, I am. And what happened? They all fell down. That same voice that had that power, the same voice when Jesus was on the boat that, that rebuked the wind and the rain and, and, and it ceased is the very same voice who when he was being nailed to the cross said, Father, forgive them. This very same voice who said, it is finished. I mean, when you study the voice of the Lord and you understand the power that's behind it and then the grace and the mercy that that very same voice can speak to us as humans and not you know, turn us to dust is incredible. And it shows us how much the Lord loves us. And, and even so much here, guys, he's speaking to a boy. It blows me away because it shows us that the Lord wants to speak to us. But do we know his voice? Are we familiar with his voice? Here, Samuel got up three times because he wasn't familiar with the voice of the Lord. But does it stay that way? Does Samuel eventually become familiar with the voice of the Lord? You bet. First Samuel chapter 16 Remember when the Lord tells Samuel to go anoint king, the king, the next king of Israel? Samuel goes, and, and he has, um, 
what's his name? David's father? Jesse. He has Jesse present his sons before him. And, and Samuel is, is looking at the oldest son. Is this, is this him, Lord? No? No, it's not him? Okay, where's the next one? Is this him, Lord? No? Okay. You know? And, and the next one, and the next one. And then, and then Samuel looks at Jesse. No, it's none of these. Do you have any more sons? And Jesse's like, well, yeah, I got one. He's in the field. You don't want him. Hey, well, go get him. And he goes out and he gets him. And that's the one. How did Samuel go from not being able to hear or understand the Lord's voice to, in chapter 16, be able to hear the voice of the Lord so clear? What do you guys think? What was it? What, what's the difference between chapter 3 and chapter 16? 13 chapters. <laughs> That's the difference. Samuel was older then. He spent time with the Lord. He got familiar with the Lord's voice. The only way that we can faithfully hear the Lord's voice, guys, is by spending time with him, by becoming familiar with this voice. Because as we looked at it already, there's voices that speak to us. There's the voice of us. There's the voice of Rose Veyu who wants to lead me down the wrong path. There's the voice of the enemy. There's the voice of this world. What's the agenda of our enemy according to John chapter 10? Steal, kill, and destroy. That's the agenda of that voice, to steal, kill, and destroy. In John chapter 10, I'll turn there. Uh, John chapter 10 also talks about the voice of Jesus, but in context, um, in reference to the shepherd's voice. John chapter 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Do we hear the voice of God speak? Some of you might be thinking, well, I've never heard the Lord speak to me. Well, when was the last time you read his word? Because this is the voice of God. This is how he speaks to us today. You know, it may not be in an audible voice, but read his word out loud. And then you'll hear his audible voice speaking. Because this is what God would have to say to us today. And, and I guess the question is, do you want to hear the Lord's voice? And sometimes it's easy for us to say yes, certainly. But the next question would be, well, are you reading his word? Because if you're not, then, the word in, then in your life, the word of the Lord is going to be rare. There is not going to be any new revelation. Not in the sense that there's going to be new scripture, but the Lord's not going to reveal anything new to you because you're not seeking to hear his voice. You're not seeking to hear from him. So back to 1 Samuel. Nick, I'm getting nervous, man. It's 7.30. Um, Therefore, Eli said to him, Eli perceived, hey, the Lord's trying to speak to you. This is what Eli tells Samuel to do. He says, go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you. See, Samuel doesn't say, you know, when the Lord calls you again. Eli's advice to Samuel is, hey, if he calls you, then this is what you need to do. If the Lord's going to speak to you, then this is how you need to respond. You must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. What an appropriate response to, to say to the Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. You see the place, Samuel's placing himself as a servant of the Lord. He's, he's calling him Lord, acknowledging this voice is the Lord. Speak, Lord, your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. I guarantee you his heart was pounding at this point. You know, once Eli tells him, hey, I think the Lord's speaking to you. He's like, what? Go lie down. Okay i going to go lie down again. And he's lying there. And we've all been in that place where we're kind of tired, you know, and we, we hear a noise, we're up, right? And, and imagine Samuel being 12 years old, kind of skittish maybe. Now he's lying down in the, the tabernacle and he's just waiting. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Isn't that interesting that the Lord came and stood? Is this a, a, 
a Christophany? Is this Jesus appearing before his physical birth? Uh, or is this like in Genesis when it says the voice of the Lord God walked with them in the garden? You know, that's a very interesting concept. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that in the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. That Jesus is the Word of God. And it's, 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 it's an interesting study to look at Genesis, the voice of the Lord God walking with them. How does that happen? Did they know the Lord in a different way than we can now? Um, here, it, it seems that the Lord is appearing to Samuel in a very similar way. Now, the Lord came and stood and called him as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. He forgot some of the lines, right? Eli said, told him to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Um, he got the last part right. No doubt his heart was pounding. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And let me back up. S Samuel's response by saying, Speak, Lord, your servant hears, guys, needs to be our response. If the Lord's speaking to us, sometimes it may sting. Sometimes it may be a conviction. It's not always warm and fuzzy, is it? Sometimes it's, you know what? You're straying. You need, you need, to, you need to get this straightened out. What about this area of your life, Rosaire? How come this is hidden? You know, you need to deal with that. And is my response, speak, Lord, your servant hears? Or is it, hmm, must not have been the Lord? <laughs> What's our response? Because this is all associated with the voice of the Lord and how he speaks to us. And so when he does speak, are we willing to listen? And again, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, not because they didn't know what the Lord expected of them, but because they didn't do what the Lord was expecting of them. Therefore, the Lord wasn't speaking to them. And he'll do that in our lives. If you aren't faithful to do what God has already told you to do, he's not going to give you anything new. And so we need to sometimes backtrack. Where, did, where was the fork in the road? What, what, where was I disobedient? And, and be obedient and then continue forward and the Lord will speak. So speak, Lord, your servant hears. Um, the Lord tells Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Samuel's probably like, Yeah, yeah, this sounds awesome. What is it? And the Lord says, In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. And I have that underlined. For the iniquity that he's unaware of? For the iniquity that he knows. Who did the Lord come and speak to on this night? Eli? The Lord came and spoke to Samuel. Why? Because Eli was aware of iniquity. Eli was not obedient to do what the Lord already called him to do. In chapter 2, we read about a man of God who came to Eli and told him, hey, you need to tell your sons to repent because they're, they're living immorally. And, and Eli was not faithful to do that. He did not ask his sons to step down. He allowed them to continue to serve publicly in ministry and live this wicked lifestyle. He failed in that way as a father. He was not obedient to do what the Lord called him to do. Therefore, when the Lord did come and speak, the Lord came to a boy. And it is, it's encouraging, right? That the Lord would come and that he would offer his voice to a boy. Obviously, the message is, is heavy, um, but it wasn't like Eli wasn't warned already. Why is the Lord, why does the Lord give us warnings? Because he wants us to repent. He wants us to get right. Why does the Lord fire a warning shot? Because he wants people to repent. Look at Nineveh. He sent Jonah. Even though Jonah didn't want to go, the Lord, the Lord wants us to repent. Verse 14. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning. That is, he didn't go back to bed. You guys been there? You guys been up? At night, you ever spent a whole night where you could not sleep? Yeah, you just, you're just thinking about something, something on your mind? Well, Samuel had something on his mind. He's like, wow, what, is, what am I going to do? So Samuel lay down until morning. It says, and he opened the doors of the house, which no doubt was his typical routine. He got up in the morning. He's got duties to go do, right? It was his job to open up the doors of the tabernacle to go sweep. Something tells me when he got up that morning, he was very quiet, trying not to wake someone up, Eli. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to have that confrontation. We're going to see. Um, 
he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. He was afraid. He didn't want to do it. You guys ever been there? You guys ever have a message you knew you had to deliver to someone and you were not looking forward to it? He didn't want to do it. And we're talking about Samuel's mentor. Samuel's 12. This guy's 90. Um, Maybe Samuel's thinking, well, he's kind of old. Maybe he's forgot about last night. Maybe I'll just tell him it was a dream. I don't know. What are you talking about, Eli? I didn't come in your room. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered. And then Samuel's response, here I am. (laughs) He tried it three times that night. It didn't work. So he says it now. And he said, Eli said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me for all the things that he said to you. Sounds like Eli had a guilty conscience, right? Sounds like Eli knew what the message was going to be. And he's like, hey, Samuel, dude, you better spill it, bro. I know the Lord spoke to you about me. What was it? Tell me now. (laughs) Because he was battling this because the Lord had already come to Eli, told him about his sons, told him to repent. He was ignoring it. And and I'm blown away at the faithfulness of this 12-year-old kid. Being able to look at someone like Eli and deliver this message that the Lord gave to him, guys, that's powerful. And yet here we are as adults and sometimes we're afraid to take a stand in the world that we live in. And the Lord tells us what we should stand for. Not that we should be known for what we stand against. We should be known for what we, who we stand for. But, but still, there are things, there are times where we are called to take stands and it's not easy. We're called to deliver a message that may not be popular, but we still need to be faithful to do it. And I'm blown away at the boldness of this 12-year-old kid who looks Eli in the eyes and, and, and it says in verse 18, then Samuel told him everything. He didn't, he didn't leave out parts. He was faithful to tell him everything. Which, by the way, Samuel is the first what of the nation of Israel? The first prophet. He's the first prophet of the nation of Israel. What's the definition of a prophet? Someone who speaks on God's behalf. And here he is at 12 years old being faithful to to be a true prophet for the nation of Israel, delivering a message, not leaving anything out, directly how God gave it to him. Um, So Samuel told him everything, hid nothing from him. And he said, this is a little depressing, Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. You think that was the appropriate response? Again, why does the Lord give a warning shot? Why did the Lord come to Samuel? Because he wants Eli to repent. He wants his sons to repent. But yet Eli's response is, well, it's the Lord. Let him do whatever he sees fit. And that's sad. I think, I think we can see that pattern in, in fathers in the day and age that we live in. Um, you know, maybe there's a family who goes to church all the time. Maybe one of their kids starts to stray. Maybe they try to go after them, and then they just kind of throw their hands up in the air. Well, Nothing I can do. We tried. We, they, we sent them to Christian school, and now they're doing this. So, you know, eh, whatever. It's sad. This is a defeated dad. He's throwing in the towel. He's, he's calling it quits. What causes a dad to come to that place? I think it's, number one, uh, a wrong relationship with the Lord. Is there anything impossible for the Lord? No. Where, what should have Eli have done? Who should have he ran to? should have ran to the Lord. He should have been reminded of Hannah when Hannah was praying for something that was impossible. She was, she was barren. She could not have kids. Where did she go? She went to the Lord. This guy, Eli, he has kids, but they're uncontrollable. They're living immorally. And what does Eli do? Nothing I can do. And he just he, he throws in the towel. If you have kids that are not walking with the Lord, if you have parents who are not walking with the Lord, whatever the scenario is, don't think it's impossible. Go to the Lord. Seek out the Lord. Eli throws up his hands, throws in the towel. Um, Verse 19, what a contrast between Eli and Samuel. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. So this second half of the verse, let none of his words fall to the ground, can be looked at two ways. Either Samuel, when the Lord spoke to him, Samuel took the voice of the Lord and it was dear to his heart. And whenever the Lord showed him something, Samuel kept it close to him, and he didn't let it fall to the ground. He didn't forget those times when the Lord spoke to him. And that, and that kind of, you know when you first accept the Lord and, and the Lord speaks to you? 
you know how you're so excited? And then what happens? What happens in our life? We become spiritually mature, right? <laughs> A.K.A. we become cold. And, and, and when, the vo- when God's voice speaks to us, it, we're not as excited anymore. You know, when we hear truths of his word, it, it kind of loses its excitement, so to speak. Not so with Samuel. He grew in the Lord and let none of his words fall to the ground. Uh, and, and you could also look at it that, that whenever Samuel spoke, that the Lord spoke through him. And so that none of Samuel's words were ever wasted. He was a prophet of Israel. He delivered the message on God's behalf. As a result, all Israel, from Dan, that's the northernmost point, to Beersheba, which is the southernmost point, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord established Samuel. The Lord raised up Samuel from when he was 12 years old. And, and the Lord did that work in his life. And the Lord does that in our day. When, when, when you look at Hophni and Phinehas and the, how, how they were living so immorally, in that very same tabernacle, there was a boy being raised up who was going to serve the Lord faithfully and be his prophet. In the world that we live in, when we look at the world and we think it's so dark, guys, there are young people being raised up. And maybe, not, maybe they're not this young. Maybe they're, maybe they're you. you know? it, it, age, again, is relative. Don't wait. Don't make the mistake of Eli. He's 90, throws his hands up in the air and calls it quits. Um, I think that was the wrong decision. Shameful, in fact. Um, he was the high priest. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And ultimately, that's how the Lord's going to speak to us. You want to hear the Lord's voice? You want to be used by the Lord? Start listening, you know, because I believe the Lord's always trying to speak to us. We're not always listening. Uh, and if we're not in his word, then how in the world do we expect him to speak to us? We have to be in his word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your written word. Lord, thank you that, Lord, you didn't just leave us stranded with, with questions and trying to figure out how we're to serve you or what you expect, Lord, but, Lord, you gave us instructions. Lord, you told us before you ascended into heaven, Lord, to preach the gospel, to be looking for your return. And Lord, your voice is precious. Lord, help us not to take it for granted. The, the, the voice of your written word, Lord, the truths that we have, or the fact that we can, we're as close to you as we want to be. Lord, that we could wake up early every day and, and get alone with your word and to hear you speak. Lord, it's on us. You have done everything possible. Lord, you've, you've sent us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your word. Lord, you've given us church services to attend, to hear you speak. Lord, I pray that there wouldn't be sin in our lives, Lord, that may hinder that, Father, but that we would be open and honest with you. And, Father, that you would take your word tonight, Lord, plant it in our lives, and pray that it would bear fruit as a result, Lord, of being obedient to it. In your holy name we pray, amen.